Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash youngchicago. I'd also like to let you know about our upcoming summer intensive. Every June, we take five days to look at the more experiential side of Jungian psychology. Um, And this summer, our intensive is called Inside Out, Creative Transformation of Cultural Chaos. Modalities will include journaling, image making, active imagination, santre, and movement. The summer intensive runs from Monday, June 18th through Friday, June 22nd from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And there are also five CE units available for each day for uh, licensed clinicians. For more information about that program, visit our website, youngchicago.org. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, analytical psychology seminars from the archives of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. The Structure and Dynamics of the Psyche with August Swig Zaidi. This episode is the first half of Structure and Dynamics of the Psyche, The World According to C.G. Jung. It was recorded in 1992. Swick introduces the basic elements of the psyche as described by Jung, persona, ego, shadow, complex, the self, archetype, and collective unconscious. This recording is part of the set Intensive Overview of Analytical Psychology, which includes the following lectures, the structure of dynamics of the psyche, the ego and its relations with the unconscious, psychological types, persona and shadow, anima and animus, self, center of the psyche, dreams and active imagination, and analysis and individuation. Dr. Swick is a clinical psychologist, hypnotherapist, and senior diplomate Jungian analyst in private practice in the Chicago area. After studying chemistry as an undergraduate, he entered military service and then changed his career path to psychology. After studying with Rosalind Cartwright in the Dream and Sleep Lab at the University of Illinois Chicago Circle, he was in the first class at the Illinois School of Professional Psychology. He interned at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry, where he trained in hypnotherapy and psychoanalytic psychotherapy, and returned to Chicago to begin private practice. He is on the teaching faculty of the Chicago Institute and the Florida and Minnesota Seminars for the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. He has published on analytic structure, supervision, alchemical imagery, active imagination, dreams, and numerous reviews. We'll have links in the show notes to purchase the second half of this seminar, and also a link to purchase the complete series, An Intensive Overview of Analytical Psychology. Hello. Welcome to uh, Structure and Dynamics of the Psyche, or The World According to C.G. Jung be getting a little bit more into the specifics today and give you the kind of broad outline, the blueprint for the psyche and some of the dynamics that kind of go on, the broad uh, view of it. And then the other courses will really deepen into some of these structures. So if you find yourself not quite understanding, um, you'll have a chance to kind of uh, get into it a little more. But please uh, feel free to ask questions. You know, the Jungian uh, method is uh, considered a dialectical method. It works best. Jung really felt that when you get two things opposed to one another, bouncing off of one another, weird things and good things can happen. And his whole nature of the psyche is based on that, and we'll kind of talk about that, but so feel free in terms of asking questions. Now, when Jung started out, he tried to understand the beginnings of his own uh, coming to awareness of the nature of things. You have to remember he was in the original Freudian group here, 
and um, Freud was cer certainly taking him under his wing, and he was going to be the heir apparent of psychoanalysis when he began having some problems with the Freudian view, especially around uh, the theory of sexuality being the underpinning of the, the dynamics and the personality. There was also another man at the time in, in the group, Alfred Adler, who came up and also split off into another school and uh, who had an opposing theory and an opposing viewpoint to Freud's notion of what was going on. And uh, Jung was sort of sitting in the middle of this, sort of feeling torn, and uh, as he writes about it, he was trying to come to grips about that he could see and experience that the Freudian perspective worked with a certain number of people, and so did the Adlerian method, and he couldn't quite understand they were really diametrically opposed. Now, if we take a look at uh, Freud's viewpoint, again with the notion of the sexuality, eros, libido, uh, coming in that the instincts sort of push forward and the personality is formed in the interface with sort of society and the parental attitudes. Uh, and sexuality is seen at the core of everything uh, merging out of it. So on the one side of the spectrum, we have this eros, love, sort of connectedness pushing forward. Now, Alfred Adler's approach was much more in terms of a power theory. He believed that the uh, underlying motivation in the personality was really a will to power, that everything was conceived as sort of a setup, that uh, if we have feelings of inferiority, we sort of push to overcome them, or we become identified with them. And Jung saw these as opposites. Now, you to just kind of consider that for a while, that the opposite of love is not hate, but power. That uh, hate is really angry love, and power is really the absence of love. And so he began to formulate his own theories, trying to struggle. Uh, Jung uh, himself, and uh, people that uh, saw the movie or know about Jung's life, I mean, during this break with Freud, was really thought to have undergone his own kind of psychotic depression. I mean, he was lost his own stance in the world. He didn't really have his own orientation. He wasn't sure that he should be breaking off with Freud. Freud was very well known. He was a father figure to him. And uh, he went into his own, what he called the uh, encounter with the unconscious. And this is documented in several uh, books uh, where he did his own paintings. He pursued his uh, dreams. He. He went back to his childhood games, built castles in the sand, uh, uh, got back to his very early memories and early dreams, and he said that all of his other theories kind of came from this period in his life. He stopped virtually all teaching because he said he didn't have anything to teach and uh, until he found his own grounding that he wasn't able to do that. It's interesting, he did ma maintain his clinical work during this period. <clears throat> not quite exactly sure how that went for most of the people that he was seeing. But uh, considering that a lot of people do think it was a psychotic depression and that he was uh, out of bounds quite a bit. Uh, most people talk about it as a creative illness. And this is one of the hallmarks of the Jungian notion. Um, whereas the Freudian approach and pretty much the Adlerian approach is always uh, throwing back. It's trying to understand what has happened. It's a reductive method, going back to the childhood experience to understand how you got to be this person that you are. Uh, Jung, again, felt that the missing piece in that was purpose. What is the illness taking one towards? His uh, psychology can really be understood as a teleology that is interested in the purpose, the core of the neurosis, the core of the illness. Of He's always feeling that there's something in that that the person is missing. So his theory began to focus on wholeness, that he considers the prime force, the libido in nature, is always seeking wholeness, always seeking a kind of oneness, a togetherness, and you can understand this in his own psychology because this was exactly what he was attempting to uh, do by bringing uh, Freud and Adler together in his own mind. And uh, this notion of the polar opposites, 
begin to get a sense of that. Uh, a lot of Jungian psychology is uh, sometimes difficult to grasp because it's always in paradoxes. Jung felt that by holding the paradox, you know, by focusing on the opposites and not taking one side, that something emerges in between. Now, he described the only thing that can do that is the symbol. It's only the symbol that can unite the opposites in a particular way and still maintain some of the mystery of what has gone on before. So one of the uh, images of wholeness, of course, is the uh, circle, as uh, one of the geometric forms that would uh, be a very primitive form of totality, of including everything, of encompassing everything. Hence, a lot of the Jungian models are always uh, circular. Um, as we enter into this, I'd like you to kind of think about some uh, things for yourself, and if you can, really write them down. First of all, I'd like to ask you to think of answering the question of who am I? And see if you can embrace that in terms of your identity, your roles, and really focus on that and kind of jot these things down for yourself. I suppose we could take up the two hours with just that part, but uh, there are some methods, uh, psychosynthesis, Asajoli, um, person who drew a lot on Jung's theories, has a technique called Who Am I? that you do that in every session. And by constantly focusing on that, you deepen into things and realize that you're also something separate from all of the uh, identity. Then I would like you to think about someone in the same sex as yourself that you really hate. Uh, you know, get it in a personal image, you know? The boss, the sister, the neighbor next door. See if you can get it into your gut, something that you can really uh, feel. And now on the uh, opposite, in that same pole of the same sex as yourself, think of the people that you admire. Think of the people that you would like to be like. Now, I'd like you to do the same thing in terms of think of someone of the opposite sex that you uh, really dislike. Sometimes this is a lot easier for people than the first one. Really consider as you're, what the qualities are that uh, brings out that feeling. And in the opposite sex person, a uh, person that you really like, the person that you're attracted to, either physically, emotionally, and sort of finally, uh, perhaps a religious people might uh, find it a little easier is to think of sort of your image of the Godhead, uh, center, creator. And for sort of non-religious people, think of um, things that you really consider as very powerful forces. Now, these images and these feeling tones will sort of be your personal compass through Jung's psyche here. I hope that you can fill in some of these images as we begin to talk about them and so that you can know them not just up here, but also in your gut and feel these things. Uh, Jung's notion was that the image was primary. Probably if Jung uh, rewrote the Bible, he would say in the beginning was the image instead of the word. And so we'll try to focus on uh, the nature of this psyche as it appears in images, as it appears in people's dreams, um, how people are taken to it, how it might appear in fairy tales or myths or popular movies that Jungian psychology, I think, would speak to all of these things. Wherever there is a very powerful emotional component, there is a one of these aspects of the psyche is present here. People see this? Fine, this comes from uh, James Hall, his book, um, Interpretation of Dreams. We might as well start from the outside here, and the kind of broad thing, as long as we're all here, the field of collective consciousness. 
This is sort of the things that we're all familiar with. And we'll see that everything has a counterpart, too. Uh, uh, Jung was very fond of alchemy, a very arcane science that uh, uh, he thought represented the psyche in the alchemists were really projecting their psyche into the world. Uh, chemistry originally uh, broke off from alchemy. But one of the notions in alchemy was so as above, so as below. So you have to keep in mind that everything that's on the outside is a mirror to what is going on in the inside. So at its highest and at its lowest, at its most beautiful and its most ugliest. Field of collective consciousness, so we have some of the great ideas of the world. We have at the highest, perhaps, the notion, say, religious ideas that have withstood the test of time, that have entered into the collective field and have been so powerful that they've maintained and large numbers of people have been connected to them. I'll take one of these images, say, uh, the Madonna, the feminine image connected to the Christ in Christian religion. Think of its counterpart today that we have, Madonna, the rock star. We have the highest and the lowest, again. Which is also an interesting image because she would, and perhaps understanding, again, popularity from a Jungian perspective is that she would seem to combine some of these notions of the virgin horror, of uh, contacting something very spiritual and yet very sensual and very sexual. Now, these are the things that have come around uh, philosophy, Socrates, everything that's been great and everything that's been the lowest common denominator, sitcoms, hula hoops, things that somehow have tap, uh, tapped into a collective consciousness and captured people's imaginations, or captured them, at least for a time being. Ones that seem to maintain, of course, are the very much more powerful ones, like the ideas of uh, religions and um, the ideas of philosophy. The other ones are usually very short-lived. But Jung was, uh, you know, very interested in popular culture and was always trying to understand why something would come about. He wrote an uh, interesting little book when there were all of these UFO sightings and was talking about the psychology of the day and the projection of this wholeness image and the roundness of the saucer that the psyche was manifesting outside of ourselves that we needed something outside of ourselves to begin pulling uh, ourselves together now as we just bump up against the outer skin of the psyche here the first thing we run into is the persona now, I'd like you to take a look at your list in terms of who am I. The persona is the things that we think we are, we'd like to be. Uh, they're all of our roles. And uh, very often, uh, Jungians have kind of a negative uh, notion about the persona because it seems so superficial. I mean, look how far away it is from everything, all the good stuff down here, you know. But one has to realize that it's, it's an archetype and that it also has its function, that it's very necessary, that uh, if one doesn't have one, one is very much uh, neurotic and having problems. One, the function of the persona is to adapt to the outer world. That's the skin. It's the focus for the psyche in being able to deal with situations. When we all have our personas here today, got our listening, our student personas, our teaching personas. Um, we all have sort of accepted rules about that. If you don't know the rules, you know, you're going to get certain animosity towards you, you're going to um, feel awkward, out of place. Uh, the persona begins to be really a problem is, first of all, if there isn't one, the person doesn't have an ad adaptation to the outer world. So you see someone that's very insecure, will stay away, very withdrawn, kind of schizoid life because they're so afraid of coming out into the world because they don't know how to act, almost literally. Uh, a lot of the persona is just behavioral learning. 
that we've picked up over the years of how to adapt in, in particular situations. The other problem with the persona is pretty much when you become totally identified with it. When you become, you know, the doctor, uh, when you become the job, when you become the wife, when you become the person that you think you are, your role in the world. And very often that uh, some people come into analysis at that particular point in time. Um, usually you'll see that sometimes with uh, retiring, very often retiring males, that their identity had been caught up so long in their job that without their job they don't know who they are. They have no sense of what to do, how to be. Literally, they're completely lost. No sense of self, no sense of connectedness. Down here you see this uh, self image here. There is no center. It had always been outside of themselves, what they could do. Uh, that they were the father, they were the provider. And sort of when these roles end, that they're thrown into chaos, they're overwhelmed and lost in identity. Think of the images that these uh, uh, very often occur in dreams will be clothes. The dream will focus on some sort of clothes or the lack of clothes. I'm sure you had dreams like that, very common dream is to be out somewhere in your pajamas or naked, um, be, uh, feeling ashamed. That's one of the feelings that underlies it when you don't have the persona is the feeling of shame is so apparent. You feel that uh, people can see right through you, that they're seeing the core, and that doesn't feel good to you. And very often that's the way to look for it in your own dreams is when it starts focusing on, I was looking for the dress, I was looking for the particular suit, I didn't have the clothes to wear. Or when it focuses on roles, that uh, I was doing this in this particular position. But the dream is commenting on this level of the psyche that the dream wants to say something about that. And Jung's notion of the dreams was that it was always to provide something missing. Uh, as we deepen into the psyche here, Jung's notion is a compensatory notion that what falls below this line in consciousness here uh, compensates what is developed in, in consciousness. And again, with the notion of wholeness, so that we'd have to eventually pick up these other parts. Are there any questions about the persona? Has anyone had this uh, type of dreams uh, that they can think of? Would you say that he would it be in agreement at this point with Freud in terms of wish fulfillment? Well, yes, wish fulfillment, this uh, certainly would be the hallmark of Freudian analysis because uh, Jung felt that it was sort of dedicated to adaptation, adaptation to the outer world. You know, uh, Freud's dictum to be able to love and work, you know, that uh, he saw Freudian psychoanalysis as really focusing on a lot of these issues, uh, persona and ego. Uh, that the notion was to kind of uncover things, to make uh, what's unconscious conscious, to make the ego stronger. Well, see, uh, Jung has got uh, very much of a different notion, but totally, he, he would think, that, and very often, this is the place that we start in, in analysis. You, you can almost, you know, though no analysis ever goes kind of in a linear fashion, but you can think of it as kind of working through these various levels. And very, and very often, that's the one that's kind of called into question, is it an adaptation to uh, outer reality? Something has happened. There's a marriage breaking up or retirement or uh, some emotional or a death, and the person hasn't adapted. So part of the pain and the suffering is caused by a failure at adaptation. So it's very, very much Freudian at this level. I remember having dreams of uh not being clothed correctly, like being in pajamas when I was early uh, in school, like first grade or something. Is that the time when mm -hmm. a child is learning how to develop a persona? Or if you look at it developmentally, uh, Jung was not very much of a developmental psychologist. He really dealt a lot more with the second half of life than he did with the first. He sort of left the first half to Freud and these things. 
but uh, talk a little bit later about the individuation process. And the first part of that process is, you know, uh, learning in childhood. That's when the dreams are much more common, uh, feeling inappropriate. You can see it in kids, you know, when they don't want to go someplace. I remember my son trying to get him to go to his graduation, you know, from uh, kindergarten. Uh, his first, you know, being on stage and, you know, he was uh, very reluctant and anxious about it didn't know how to act, didn't want to put on the little cap and gown, drove us crazy. But very much so in childhood, it's where we should learn these roles. That's the task in this first half of life. There's a question back. Oh, it was just easier for me to think of Kusama as a complex as opposed to an archetype. Uh, why is that? <laughs> well, I like to think of it, uh, you know, Hall divides them up as in terms of relational and identity structures, which I think is a nice way of looking at it. Not, not all unions really talk about it that way. But uh, these aspects here as structures of the psyche, they're comparable to like Freud's id, ego, superego. And uh, so it has a grounding. It's like everyone has to do that. That's the hallmark of an archetypal experience, you know. it's. Uh, from the beginning of time, this was a task, and, it, and so it's ingrained, it's a part of the mind. So, and that's where I think a lot of unions sometimes play it down, you know, uh, superficial, it's just that. But it has very deep roots, it's very necessary in the psyche. And so that's the notion of it being an archetypal, that it's a structuring of the psyche itself. Any other questions? As we move just inside the persona, now this level of this interface with the outer world, first structure we run into is the ego here. Very common word in everyday language. People either have a big one or, or no ego. Uh, Buddhists are egoless. Uh, there's a, a lot of problems with this particular concept here. But it's uh, generally the, the notion of who uh, the I, who you more know yourself to be, not just think and want yourself to be. It's the uh, I-ness quality, and uh, it's a much simpler structure than Freud talked about it. Freud really talked about there are mechanisms of defense, and there's a part of the ego that's unconscious. And uh, Jung talked about it as much simpler terms of identity, and it is a complex, as we begin. We'll talk about complexes here. Um, and you can think of it as sort of the center of uh, consciousness. Um, you can think of it as sort of like a flashlight, you know, where you can sort of focus on things. You know, you can kind of be a different person in different situations, sort of related very much to persona, having a different role in some things. But you can think that, you know, some people in a private situation may be very much more open. Uh, in a public situation, they may be very much more inhibited. Uh, so it's, it's really not set either. It's kind of a shifting. It's not quite a, a very secure boundary, and it can move around. And you can notice that, uh, that there are different, it can focus on different things. Uh, the part that's in the ego is really connected to will. It's the things that you can really choose to do. We'll see in, uh, as we deepen into this structure, uh, Jung's notion was that uh, most people think that this is the captain of the ship here, you know, that it's the center. Uh, and Jung's notion of the psyche is sort of presenting them that it's not quite that way, and that the uh, ego eventually will need some balancing, and that it, it's hardly the captain of the ship. But it is uh, the most that we know about I, and it's the qualities that we keep into our consciousness. You know, it's the qualities that generally have been allowed by the uh, parental attitudes. You know, the, uh, they're reinforced, oh, you're a good boy, that's good, you know, behavioral psychology, reinforcement, going to make all these things part of the ego. Someone responds from the outside, this is how the ego begins to form. Um, all the qualities that are sort of split off, see, so end up in a different structure here. But these are the parts that we allow ourselves to think about ourselves consciously and that you could probably describe about yourself. 
to someone. Now, the other part that forms when the parents say, no, 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 you can't be angry at your brother, no, no, you know, don't touch that, that's bad, you're going to grow hair on your palms. It uh, becomes a, a type of alter ego here. This becomes uh, what Jung called a shadow. It's all the attitudes and feelings and images uh, of ourself that uh, have become split off from our identity. We don't know them as us. We don't want to claim them. They feel bad. They feel dirty. They're imbued with shame that they have been responded to very negatively in the outer world, and so they've been relegated to this existence in the underworld. And it has been pushed down, but they're part of us too. Now, and that's why it goes that we start going below this level of consciousness here. We start going into the unconscious. And truly the shadow here, uh, in Jungian terms, very often it's talked about broadly. It's about all the things that we don't know as ourself. It's all the not me qualities around it. But more specifically, it is more of an alter ego, these qualities that have really been pushed out of existence by our particularly, uh, particular living experience, by uh, parental attitudes, by society. Again, you can hear the commonality with uh, Freud's perspective here. This is, this we start entering into right here with the shadow is what uh, Jung called the personal unconscious and it would be equal to Freud's uh, unconscious. It's the stuff that gets repressed. It's the painful things that we don't want to think of. It's the things that are sometimes accessible, but it takes some work uh, to bring up. You know, that it's very much, and uh, what Freud described and the Freudian approach is pretty much the one that will uncover uh, these particular attitudes. And I'd like you to uh, take a look at your uh, uh, descriptions there of the people same-sexed images. Think of those ones that you hate. It's probably the best description of your own shadow. It's like, that's uncomfortable for people, you know, and they'll fight and they'll rebel against this thing. And it's one of the biggest problems that we have. Here is the first big split in the psyche. Uh, here is the first opposing factions that you'll, people will fight to the death to sort of say that they don't have these qualities uh, in themselves. And the question to ask yourself is not um, if you have them, it's where do you display them? Because if they're shadow to you, you're not going to be generally like these people. This is where a lot of people misunderstand the concept, especially in analysis when you talk about it. Well, this is your shadow. Um, it's, it's not that you're like that everywhere and you're completely unconscious of it. You know, it's like there are very subtle places uh, and there are certain times and circumstances where you can demonstrate these traits and you just don't want to claim them, you don't want to see these points, and it's much easier to split it off. It's the core experience of discrimination. It's one of the major problems we have in the world, uh, racial problems. You think of the, the core aspect of what we put out there into the various groups, the parts that we don't want to see in ourselves, Jung's notion is that anything that's unconscious will first be found in projection. That's a very important idea, is that you'll find it in the outer world first, and that gives you the chance to begin to take it in, to own it yourself, which is a very difficult process. So you have a Saddam Hussein, you have to have a George Bush, you know, their counterparts. You know, oh, let's see a grimace here, you know, we, we have the, the wimp constellates his bully, the bully constellates his uh, person that's going to attack him. It goes on and on. I mean, you can look through history. Uh, it's the uh, universal problem of the shadow. We're going to be doing a conference on uh, the shadow problem in uh, October and various aspects and its manifestations.
and you have to also remember that it's the qualities, most of the time we talk about it kind of in a negative way, but you have to remember that if the ego is deficient of positive qualities, the shadow will actually carry the light. You know, that uh, the shadow for, say, the very inferior person will always be these other people. They've got it together. They can do these things. Everybody else has got it. So that the sh shadow actually carries positive qualities, too. Um, we tend to think of it more in negative. I think its description as shadow, as dark, uh, about the darker emotions. But you have to remember that it's also the qualities, um, say, a positive quality that was responded to negatively by the parents is going to end up in the shadow, say, uh, artistic. Uh, quality that was never responded to or valued, a uh, person is not going to know it as themselves. You know, oh, everybody else is so artistic, I can't do that, I'm not creative. So take a look at also your positive images here uh, in the same sex person. And the same sex quality, I mean, for Jung was that these are at least things that you can imagine, you know, as part of yourself. That for a woman, they're in other women. For a male, they're in other males. Uh, it sort of breaks down. Uh, I think we're getting away from real hard descriptions uh, of that, of saying that it has to be particularly that way, because uh, for a man, a woman might have other qualities that are closer to his identity uh, than a male, and that would really be considered a shadow quality rather than a deeper uh, oppositional quality. Now, the images that these will appear in dreams, of course, are uh, other same-sexed uh, images, figures in the dream. So if you're a male, other male figures in the dream will be uh, one way to consider them is aspects of yourself. Uh, Jung has two ways of approaching the dream, one at the objective level, that the dream figure is exactly who it purports to be. So if you're dreaming about your father, you should look at the dream that it's saying something about your father. But say if it's an unknown male that you start looking at that as an aspect of yourself and it's saying something about the relationship uh, to that part of yourself. And so these figures that you're talking about here that you wrote down, uh, you may find in dream figures that uh, you may find that the dream is kind of talking about them and your relationship to the shadow. Are there uh, any questions about that? Well, uh, you know, he, uh, he dropped down into a few Latin uh, words uh, over here. He, he was caught in the metaphor, actually, the way that I understand it is, you know, you don't have any depth without a shadow. You know, if you just have the light, it's the shadow that gives you perspective. It's the shadow that really gives you depth. And so, again, he's a very phenomenological. He's trying to describe the experience, you know, and get you into it. So it's that part, you know, if the light's out here, it's the part that's kind of cast back here that you don't want to see. Uh, Harry Wilmer has got a, a nice book, The Nuts and Bolts of Jungian Psychology, where he's got these cartoons and stuff, and he's got one, the image of the shadow like that. So it's that part, in it, and it's, it appears like a silhouette, you know, especially in the beginning, when you start looking at things this way, it's not filled in. You don't have any details. It's kind of a, you know, a black space. And as I say, people will, you know, really fight tooth and nail to, to kind of say that they don't have these particular qualities in them. Um, Each individual's uh, ego and shadow are, are uh, determined by the environment. To a large part, right? And it's going to be the outer environment that sort of responds to certain aspects and uh, negates other aspects. So usually what ends up in the shadow, you know, we can count on sexuality, anger. I mean, no one gets through life without, you know, parts of these things being split off. You know? And again, we see that's kind of Freud, Freud's notion, you know, uh, love, sex, uh, anger, death. 
you know, that these are the parts that society really doesn't respond very well to, so they're the ones that are always, are always getting knocked off the identity and pushed into the unconscious. Subjectively, that each figure in the dream is really an aspect of yourself. You could almost, as we go through this, you could overlay this onto a dream and kind of see how the psyche is interacting with one another, uh, how the different figures. Uh, Jung felt uh, that these things in the psyche want to personify. They want to kind of form images. They want to form uh, separate personalities. And so at the subjective level, uh, anybody that's familiar with, say, Gestalt therapy, uh, Pearl's lifted a little bit of uh, Jung in this, uh, because Gestalt therapy is almost totally subjective level. You take everything as an aspect of yourself. Now, Jung wouldn't be that dogmatic about it. He does say there are things that belong to the outer world, uh, and you have to always be in that interface of sort of separating out what's you and what's the other person. But uh, definitely one way of approaching the dream is to consider it as all aspects of yourself. And then it's a little drama, it's a little play about how these components are interacting. If the other approach is objective, how is that formation of that? Is that an outer world's uh, observation of what objective is? Well, he, what he wanted to say there was that uh, the dream can actually comment about something in the outer world. You know, a typical dream like this is, you know, the person that comes into analysis and they said, oh, you know, my father was wonderful, just a wonderful man, you know. And the first dream, you know, portrays the father as a skid row bum, you know. It's like, okay, you know, not particularly taking that dream subjectively, that it's really commenting on here's something that the father is probably no more skid row bum than he is this perfect person. But again, the idea of compensation and the balance that the real father is going to be somewhere in the two when you hold both notions, that your real father can emerge in that. And so the objective part is trying to say that there is some something out there uh, that the psyche responds to. Any other questions? Now, at this particular level, too, we run into all the complexes. So in life here, the uh, psyche begins to uh, fragment. We have, you know, there are many, as many complexes as there are uh, traumatic experiences. You have money complexes, sex complexes, inferiority complexes, mother complexes, father complexes. Anything where, you know, the personality brushes up against something and it doesn't go smoothly is likely to form a complex. It's like a little blister on the uh, psyche. Uh, Jung describes it as sort of a, uh, a group of feeling-toned images. It's like a little magnet, you know, and proof of this he found in the association experiment. Uh, Jung's original work was uh, he developed a galvanic response and gave people the association test. He was really the person that developed that. And you would find that you would hit certain words and the person would have different responses. They would sort of blank out, they would take longer to respond, they would have weird associations. That uh, here is sort of a lit literal proof of the unconscious, that you can actually measure these particular things. And in the measuring, you have to also realize that it, it's the part that really connects you to body. Complexes are also your own gyroscope of sort of who you are. And it, in a positive way, it sort of creates the world for you. You know, it's the familiar world. It could be a painful world sometimes. Someone with a very powerful mother complex is going to see that mother, uh, if it's a male, in all of their relationships with women. But it's a familiar world. You know, it sort of lays out the map for you, so you at least think you know where you're going. So on a positive side, you see complexes kind of work this way. Uh, they give us our sense of uh, self our, and our sense of what the world is about. Of course, in a negative way, they rob us of energy. They take 
uh, things from us. Uh, they don't allow us to be free. They don't allow us to express ourselves. Um, particular uh, complexes in psychoanalysis, the goal is to really integrate their energy more into the ego. You know, if there's a very powerful mother complex, then you're looking at that relationship with mother and trying to sort that out so that you can, say, relate to other women uh, without all of this emotionality. And as I say, that hallmark of the emotional response, you know, wherever there's strong emotion, there's a complex. You know, it's your red flag to let you know that something is going on. So it's not like, uh, you know, this is a very uh, difficult thing to do. I mean, you, you'll probably uh, find five complexes on the way home today. <laughs> you know, just think when you start screaming at that guy, you know, that's uh, frustrating you in the car in front. How could they be so ignorant? You know, you never do that, Shadow. Uh, but uh, they do. And uh, the problem of the complexes, too, is, uh, you know, to get this energy back inside, there are different ways that one can relate to a complex. First of all, a complex could be completely unconscious. You don't even know about its presence. I don't know if many of you have seen the movie uh, Lost in America. Uh, it was kind of a wonderful movie about this couple. They sell everything and they're going to go around uh, the U.S. and uh, they stop in Las Vegas and the wife goes into the casino and blows all of the money in the first stop. Uh, there was an unknown gambling complex that she was <laughs> unaware of and got caught. Now, the thing you have to realize, you know, and a lot of people thought that Jung was, again, a little weird about this, was that uh, the autonomy of the complexes. Uh, Jung talks about them as if his model is more like a multiple personality, that these things have energy and they're almost split off personalities that want to do what they want to do say in this particular example, this gambling complex is you're in it, you know, you become it. You can be sitting there going, I shouldn't be doing this and forking out the money. Typical example that most people can relate to is food, you know, a very common complex. Many times we have that experience, gee, I want to diet and do that. And you find yourself, uh, you know, scouring the cabinets, you know, uh, just, uh, grabbing any food that you can all the time. You know, you're going, I don't want to be doing this. That's the autonomy of the complex. That's the experience of sort of being taken over by something. Uh, Jung used very primitive words for this. Uh, he hearkened back to an earlier time, medieval time, and he talked about possession, that that comes closer to what the experience is like. It's like being possessed by something. And the ego can exist right there, and you can know about the complex. That's where a lot of people have uh, difficulty. They say, well, I know about this complex, you know. People are in analysis for two years. Oh, it's that mother complex again. But the knowing about it is not the same thing as really integrating the complex. You can name it. You can know when it's around, but you may be completely helpless in the face of it. And uh, when Jung started talking about the autonomy of these things, a lot of people started getting uncomfortable because they like to think of the ego as the captain of the ship. And especially existentialists were very uncomfortable with this because they had this notion that one has to, a will to uh, freedom, to uh, choose things. Okay, the, the other way that you become aware of the complex is, uh, and mentioned earlier, is in projection. You see it out there. You see a strong emotion. You feel attraction. You feel repulsion. You know that a complex is being uh, stirred up so that it can be identified with. The other possibility is the possession. It's being completely identified with the complex. It takes over. You become that thing. I've had more women enter analysis uh, saying, I realized I was becoming my mother, and it scared them. And they never wanted to be that. And all of a sudden, they got to a certain point in life and found that all of a sudden, they had become all of these things that they detested. And that was uh, their impulse into uh, psychotherapy. The last thing, and the only real way of integrating the complex, is confronting it. 
a true confrontation with the complex. And again, this is where, you know, Jungian psychology somewhat differs. Freudian psychology, I think, is more on that level of, you know, identifying it, making it conscious, and that's going to be the cure. But it becomes very clear that insight doesn't cure anything. It may give you the option for healing, for a change, but there has to be a true confrontation, and Jung developed certain uh, techniques for confrontation with that. One of the most powerful techniques that he talked about and felt that was even uh, greater than dream interpretation, which a lot of Jungian analysis is based on, is active imagination. Uh, and for people interested in that, I would really uh, recommend Johnson's book, uh, Inner Work. It's probably one of the best descriptions of active imagination in the last part of the book. Active imagination is to take this seriously, you know, is to begin to personify it to get the image, to start carrying on dialogues with it, to find out what it wants, why it's here, what its goals are, to treat it uh, in some way that you realize that it's a powerful force and that you have to develop a relationship to it. And in that process of the relating to it, very often that's when the complex begins to change. And it's only through that relationship that very often uh, complexes will change. And it might also be noted, uh, uh, though I, I don't think you see this too often in, in Jungian books, but positive experience can create complexes too. Uh, object relations, which is a big field of uh, psychology, really talks about how negative experiences cause splitting and, uh, and trauma. And Freud talked about that, but in a more Eastern view, you can kind of see that very positive experiences cause the same kind of problem when we want to recreate them, you know, have that wonderful experience or that wonderful vacation or that wonderful sexual time, and you're in trying to make it happen again when it happened spontaneously the first time. That's what made it so great, that you're again not in the here and now. You're living in relationship to something else, something in the past. So it's kind of important to realize that, uh, you know, positive experience, real positive experiences sometimes uh, also create more problems uh, than they do help uh, when you seek after them, you know, when you're trying to recreate them again. No, no, I don't think Jung would even hold out the hope for that, you know, that's why I think the notion of relationship, as we talk about the complex, the complex has a nuclear element. The core of every complex is an archetype. Um, so the center of it, and archetypes can't be integrated. So there is a part of this complex, you know, that uh, it's sort of an illusion that one can sort of integrate these things, that one is not going to have a mother complex anymore. It may not cause as much problems, it may not come into play, but again, at times of stress, at a crisis, or the person is drunk, uh, where the ego, where the consciousness is again lowered, um, you know, you see it reemerge. You know, I have sort of, in analysis, never seen anything quite disappear. You know, there's always the potential, there's always the possibility, a kernel of it, but generally the integration occurs where it's not as problematic. Uh, for the person. It's not as immediate. See, what happens when this complex, it erupts into consciousness. Um, it's a lowering of consciousness. You know, it's the same thing as in states of exhaustion, uh, drugs, alcohol. Uh, the ego and consciousness is lowered, and very often, you see, uh, uh, in AA, you can see this with the alcoholic, what often comes out is the shadow personality. One of the problems in alcoholism is uh, for a person who's been alcoholic for a lot of times, they've been living in their shadow. They've been living in their alter ego. And uh, sometimes um, the AA approach is, is negative kind of towards that because they don't see anything positive. You know, well, there's nothing positive in the drinking behavior, but one must realize that, again, it's there for a purpose. And so that there's a core. See, there's, uh, this is Jung's notion here that there's a piece of the personality that's trying to come out, but it's caught in this blister. It's caught in this part that's drawing all of the energy to it. And so the ego can be more free. 
but I don't think it ever, you know, disappears. Depression? Yeah, it's usually uh, kind of talk about that as, you know, the mood of the depression, but the depression itself will usually be an interaction of complexes. There usually will be a persecuting side. Uh, again, what you're trying to do sometimes in active imagination, say with a depression, is try to personify the voice. Uh, you know, you're no good, you're never going to get anywhere, it's all useless trying to split off from that. You're trying to have a relationship with that. So the depression itself is not that depression is a symptom that the complexes, that there's probably a number of complexes. Start taking a look at the dreams in the depressed person. You start seeing more the uh, underlying picture of why the depression is there. We'll take a little break for 10 minutes. Come on back and sink deeper into the psyche. <laughs> This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org.